Alrighty, so let's start here. Since it is Super Bowl week, let's relive one of the most infamous endings of a Super Bowl of all time. Seahawks, uh, Patriots, Russell Wilson going against Tom Brady on the one-yard line, and they choose to pass the ball. I mean, folks, what is going on? What? Why did they do this? Well, we know why they did it. We have a theory on why they did this. And Pete Carroll threw the ball because he wanted Russell Wilson to be the guy. He wanted to him to be the man that won the Super Bowl, not Marshawn Lynch. There was a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of people didn't like Marshawn Lynch at this time as kind of, you know, um, towards like a business angle since he was like so outspoken and, you know, grabbing his crotch on, on touchdown runs, you know, all of that. So, Pete Carroll, in my opinion, didn't want to give that kind of clout to Marshawn Lynch. That's why they didn't run it on second and goal from what, the two yard line. So, Pete Carroll wanted Russell Wilson to have that kind of clout. Hey, this man just made the game-winning throw in a Super Bowl against the legend Tom Brady. That's the narrative that Pete Carroll wanted to go with. That's why they didn't run it from the one-yard line. And then we get the Malcolm Butler. I mean, what a play by him defensively. Just to automatically read the play and then bully the wide receiver to go and, you know, shoulder-to-shoulder contact and get the pick. So what an ending to a Super Bowl. And I mean, folks, just how crazy is you know history like narratives can just change at a, at the snap of a finger I mean if Tom Brady loses this game you know that's one less ring from him you know it's kind of crazy to you know if we were gonna go down that thinking when was this which was, which was like what six years ago How, holy cow six years ago so um you know this was uh Patriots get the win because of a poor call by Pete Carroll unfortunately um did Russell Wilson make the right decision on this ball, I mean, it's the play. I mean, you go here, you set up the pick down low to force the ball there. Unfortunately, Malcolm Butler just makes an absolutely fantastic play on the ball. Um, all righty, uh, let's keep going here. Um, here we go. Well, we all know Matt Stafford got traded to the Rams, and um, there's a little um, little information here from uh, who? Uh, Br Gridiron, Bleacher Report Gridiron. Uh, saying that Matt Stafford asked the Lions to trade him anywhere but the Patriots. And then this Twitter account said, wow, like that's supposed to shock. That was supposed to be a shocking statement. Why would Matt Stafford want to go to the Patriots? What did the Patriots do for Tom Brady? They never paid him, and they never gave him a star-wide receiver consistently. So why would Matt Stafford want to go to an organization that doesn't treat the greatest quarterback of all time on the biggest pedestal of all time? Why are they not, hey, here's the money, here's all the weapons, thank you for all the rings, thank you for the 20-year dynasty that you've led us on, now um, you know, now it's our turn to repay them. The Patriots never did that. So why would, Matt, why would they do that, if they didn't do that for Tom Brady, why would the Patriots organization do that for Matt Stafford, who has... I don't, has he even gotten to a playoff game? Has Matt ever played in a playoff game? I'm sure he's been in like one. I don't know if he's ever made it past the first round of the playoffs. But why would the Patriots organization pay Matt Stafford and get Matt Stafford the weapon if they never did that with Tom Brady? So why would Matt Stafford want to go to New England? Like, this isn't surprising. This isn't shocking. This is a non-story. Um... Yes, I, I would not want to go to the Patriots either if I was a quarterback. They didn't treat the greatest quarterback of all time as the greatest quarter, quarterback of all time. They treated him like he was a, a second stringer backup that impressed them like for one game. That's how the Patriots treated Tom Brady. So, of course, Matt Stafford wouldn't want to go there. He would he would get treated even worse. And how do you even how do you even treat a quarterback worse than the Patriots treated Tom Brady? I don't know how you do that. So, of course, Matt Stafford didn't want to go to the Patriots. Alrighty, and then uh, let's head to the Eagles here. Nick Sarani, the newly acquired head coach for the Eagles, saying that uh, uh, there is, quote, competition is the core value that we're going to use for every single position when he was talking about quarterback. So, I mean, you got a new head coach. He wants to probably implement a new system. He wants to kind of see all of his players. So, of course, he's going to say this. And, you know, this is something that should be said. Hey, competition, new guy in town here. Let's see what everybody's got. Maybe I don't kind of value these skills over the, those skills like um you know Doug Peterson did so 
You got two real good quarterbacks here. Carson Wentz, he's proven he's good. He just can't stay healthy. And what we saw from Jalen Hurts in the in the brief games that he played, they were it was pretty decent. It was something solid that you can definitely build off of, and you could see some nice talent there that Jalen Hurts was playing with. So there's two quarterbacks for the Eagles here. Nick Cerrone just wants to see, hey, show me what you guys got, because I I know what Carson Wentz can do. I've been watching y'all on you know Sundays, you know just couch coaching. Um, so I want to see what you guys do, you know, on the field with my real eyes. And we'll go from there. And I mean, he doesn't. I mean, this isn't a bad situation for the Eagles to be in. Yes, they have a huge contract with Carson Wentz, but they're still on a rookie deal with Jalen Hurts. And did he even go first round? So he doesn't even have like first round money contracts. So you've got two quarterbacks here. Really, no rush to figure out which one is going to be the guy. Just make sure you make the right decision and live with the decision that you go with. So I've got no uh, problems here with Nick Cerrone kind of taking his time, just making sure he makes the right decision because this could instantly blow up in his face. I mean, this one decision alone can make or break Nick Cerrone in his first year. So he knows this is a tough decision to make. He knows he has to kind of feel it out, wait to the very last second to make the actual decision, and then have to live with it for the rest of his career. So big decision here for Nick Cerrone, and I'm glad that he's taking his time on it. <clears throat> Alrighty, let's switch over to the NBA for these last couple of stories here. And, you know, the biggest game of last night was probably Wizards and Nets, and the Nets losing. Oh, my goodness. Yes, James Harden didn't play, but you still have KD and Kyrie, and you still can't get it done. Oh, my goodness. So... But we're not talking about the Nets here. We're talking about the Wizards and Bradley Beal because I still see a lot of people saying that they feel sorry for Bradley Beal and that he needs to be traded. But, you know, he did do it to himself. Unfortunately, he signed the contract extension last season after John Wall got hurt. So what was he doing? Like, signing that big contract, you know you probably weren't going to get a big superstar back with John Wall, you know, after coming off that injury. And I know he probably didn't think that he was going to have to play with Russell Westbrook in no else on this squad but at the end of the day he signed it he knew what he was doing he could have went anywhere else everybody was willing to like trade for him Pe people were going to sell out to get Bradley Beal uh, but he decides to stay there with the Wizards and then this is something else I hate this is kind of why we wanted to bring it up so the the Wizards were basically losing all game, and you we see Bradley Beal on the bench. I know this is a bad picture, so let's switch it to this one. Bradley Beal on the bench during a timeout where everybody else is still on the floor, and he's just not interested. I mean, he's not even in with the team, right? So just kind of being a little lame. I mean, yes, even if you don't want to be on a team, you still got to play for your teammates because, you know, they have no kind of, you know, they have no power on what happened with your deal or with uh, other people's deals. They just are playing out there because they're playing for their own contracts. Not everybody is as a big of a superstar that Bradley Beal is. So the fact that Bradley Beal was on the on the actual bench here, not even with the team, just kind of being a little lame because he doesn't want to be there. Because Bradley Beal doesn't want to be there, the entire team has to suffer because of that. Uh, it, it, that is a big pet peeve of mine. I really hate that. So we see him, you know, slouching around slump being uninterested when the when the wizards are losing but then we get this frame when they when they win he's all smiles and you know hey yeah we did it and all this but you know this is lame because you know when you're losing you you're uninterested but you're when you're winning oh now it's all right now it's okay to be here now you want to be here because you're winning kind of lame here folks truly a little lame so I mean, do what you want. I mean, I honestly don't care. Honestly, I just think it's a little lame. So uh, that's what we have for the Wizards. Um, and then let's quickly talk about, I mean, we'll probably bring this up as well when we cover the actual game, but the 76ers and the Pacers, I mean, folks, we found the one flaw on this Pacers team. They have no great closers. Nobody can close the game. Um, I think we've seen this for the last couple of games. Are they on a couple game losing streak? Let me double check this. Uh, the Pacers, they are on a two-game losing streak, and I, that's what I thought. They are, they're just blowing games, having leads, and then losing them. I mean, folks, look at this. Without Joel Embiid, the 76ers trailed 102-86 with 8 minutes and 34 seconds left in the game. Then the, the 76ers went on and outscored the Pacers 33-8 for the rest of the game and got the win because of it. This Pacers team, there's no true kind of superstar leader on that team to help you close out games. 
possibly bad coaching as well. So, you know, just something to kind of keep in mind. We can't buy the, this Pacers team because there is no closer. I mean, you score eight points with eight minutes left in the game, and then you get outscored 33-8 to eight and lose the game. It was a real dysfunctional loss at the end for the Pacers. And, you know, without Joel Embiid in that 76ers lineup, there is no excuse for the Pacers to do that. So we found the one flaw in the Pacers. We were hesitant to put them in the top 10. They kind of impressed us a little bit, but now we're seeing maybe a, a, a fault of theirs kind of starting to develop here. There is no closer, no end of, you know, fourth quarter. I'm going to get you the bucket when it's needed. So this is a little, little uh, big red flag here, a little big red flag for the Pacers here. Alrighty, and let's uh, close it out here. Our moneymaker took a little bit of a hit last night. Not Nothing awful. I mean, we hit one of three. Obviously, we didn't hit. But uh, Magic plus five and a half. We are officially over the Magic. I will tell you this. They're done. We can't. Aaron Gordon's no longer a superstar. We're not even thinking of him, of him as a superstar anymore. Vucevic, once again, not a superstar. Not even an all-star anymore. So we're 100% selling our Magic stock. We will not be taking them. We will not be rooting for them. We will not think they will win any games because this is a bad team. I thought Aaron Gordon was good. I thought Vucevic was good. But these last Last couple games I mean nobody's even putting up like 20 points a game so what are we doing here there's no good playmaker for this magic team I thought we had good value with the five and a half but uh, you know once again they are floundering big so uh, you know hey you know when we when we lose our bets we still learn from them and we're learning we're done with the magic Jazz minus two and a half. Well, they just let absolute. I mean, joke it go absolutely wild on them. Twenty-two points in the first quarter alone. He ended up with like forty points. Nobody could stop that man down low. So we we did miss the mark there with Jazz minus one and a half. And then uh, 76ers minus one and a half. We hit that. Hey, nice. Good old comeback against the Pacers, and they get the win because of that. And, um, you know, we ended up getting actually not good value on the 76ers team because uh, we took this before the official news broke of Joel Embiid not in the starting lineup. So we locked it in at minus one and a half. And I think once the news broke that Embiid was not playing, I think the line jumped to like 76ers plus three and a half. So we didn't even get the max value, and we still hit. So, hey, we'll take that all day. Uh, but we're looking to get back on track today, folks. I mean, hey, you know, we hit two in a row. We took a slight step back, and we're ready to get right back on track with these hits. So I believe there is a couple of games on tonight that we can pick through, so we will be doing that.